Okay, so it's called Achievement Unlocked, and it's about reward systems in, in video games, and I actually share with, with Cheer uh, an affinity for visualized information. And um, I have to announce, first of all, that part of my presentation, due to technical reasons, got, got lost, and this was the bit where I displayed that visualized information is wonderful. Just take that from me for now, and I'll explain to you later what it is. So, uh, this is about reward systems in, in video games, and I think that we can take, uh, we should take, take notice of what's happening there, uh, because they can teach us a lot about making education engaging. Um, let me just try this. Yes, ah, clear. I, what, I, what I have today is not a lesson plan. This is completely different from what we just heard. I don't have anything to show you yet. There is no gizmo, no application. It's simply, um, as this as, uh, session was, was titled, my expectation for a future classroom. Um, and uh, who am I to expect anything? Well, I studied new media and I'm a teacher uh, in Amsterdam at Het Amsterdamse Lyceum. Uh, I'm also a gamer, which is perfectly fine because uh, it's a humanities, it's called participant observation. Um, and I'm going to talk quite a bit about video games. So, <clears throat> what do I expect of a future classroom? Well, I expect uh, performance of students to be captured and tracked and stored um, into uh, a, what I call a data double, and I'll explain that term later. Um, so that students can reflect on their learning, and I think this is very similar to what happens to players who play video games connected to achievement systems. They are also uh, enabled to reflect on their own learning through <coughs> visualized information, I might add. I'm going to talk about three things. I'm going to talk about reports, visualized information, and I'm going to talk about data levels. Okay, so maybe, I don't know, do I need to be on the screen? What it says on the left, it says real life rewards. I've observed a gap between real life rewards and digital rewards. Um, in real life rewards you need to work pretty hard for your rewards in uh, the digital spheres or in game space. Rewards are absolutely everywhere. Game space is teeming with, with rewards. Um, as I said, in real life you need to work pretty hard for your rewards and no place do we make people work harder for their rewards than in schools. Yeah? So how do we in schools reward students? We give them a pat on the back or we give them an A or 10 depending on where you're from. Um, and what you do basically is you create a condensed form of their capacities. Uh, and in doing so, you also generate some sort of data. Um, you go from observed wisdom to data, giving them a seven or six, and you can see how that, how that works. But I'm more interested in rewards that are not necessarily part of a conclusion, but part of a development. Yeah? So uh, data that can make you go, uh, or actually data that can make you go from data to wisdom, uh, because the rewards are stored, because they are accumulative, and because they are permanent. <clears throat> but you might want to wonder why do we need to worry about these rewards so much? Are we really going to cater to a bunch of overstimulated geeks? Well, this is not necessarily the story of becoming desensitized to real life rewards. It's more about how digital rewards have become so effective. Um, and I think that we can harness the engaging uh, didactics of digital rewards in education. So, uh, the fair question to ask first of all is, do games teach? And I think the answer is yes, they have to teach, because if a game doesn't teach, nobody's going to buy the game. The game, at the very least, needs to teach you how to play the game. Agreed? So, games, in effect, are fully operational teaching machines, because you know, otherwise the game would not be bought. Um, and then you can ask, well, what do they teach? I don't think they teach you how to slay a dragon, or how to fly a plane, or how to win a war. Um, I think they teach systems, and that's an ongoing debate in game studies. We either think they teach systems, they teach you how to develop a rapid response to a challenge posed by an algorithm, or you think you know they can teach you. They can, they can. But so, in either case, whether you're in one camp or the other, whether you think okay they teach systems, or you say no, they teach you know, the content, um, they tell you that you're on the right track by way of rewards. Okay, in-game rewards. These are called. So traditionally, these are suits of armor or ranks, or pets, they're part of the game world. Um, and you might also wonder, how come rewards play such a central role in video games? Well, the answer is in its, uh, what you can call rewarded lineage, or the family tree of play. Um, and if you look at the family tree of play of the video game, so just to be clear, this is not a technological lineage, because that would start with you know, an abacus, and then on to Babbage, etc. This is the family tree of the site of play, it starts at the midway fair, if you look at it um, historically, so games of chance, yeah? and then it moves on to lounge and tavern games, which is pinball, and then to the arcade games. And what is funny to see, or what you can 
IFC is that initially there was a vested interest in keeping people engaged. People needed to buy more coins, more lives, more metal balls, etc. And that got lost a bit when it developed into the home systems, but it's absolutely back now with the network generation of consoles. So there is a financial interest in keeping players engaged. Yeah? Um, because players need to you know, download additional content, or they need to pay their monthly subscription fees, etc. etc. Um, achievements can be framed as part of this development of wanting to keep players engaged all the time. And achievements are, for those of you who are lost here, uh, they're pretty new, that's okay. So this has been very popular since 2005. In 2005 the Xbox 360 launched, and that is a network console, so a network device for come to play video games. Because of this network, the system can keep track of what you've done so far, and it can reward you for what you've done so far. And these kinds of rewards, awarded for what you've done so far, are meta rewards. They're not part of the game world, they're part of a, sort of a meta system of keeping track of how people perform. Right? Um, and um, uh, they're, they're not entirely new, I included a little picture on the top right, um, that is uh, from, taken from the Atari 2600 system, this is back in the 80s, where Activision would award players who took a photograph of the television screen, um, because the manual listed a number of challenges, you could take a photograph, send it to Activision, and you got a badge to display locally that you, you know, in this case, took down a number of helicopters in, in, in chopper commandos. Um, <clears throat> the big difference is, of course, that these, you know, these things were displayed locally, now we display them globally through the network. They come in big lists, they have names and titles and they have criteria or objectives to follow. Right? Almost every game has one of these things, never mind the content, it's all rather brutal, it's taken from a very bloody game. Um, but they come in, in, in pretty common categories. Uh, you get a, a meta reward for progression, for completion, for mastery, uh, for eccentricity perhaps, things you would not have done otherwise, for um, exploration, and I have oh, two for you, look at that. You now understand achievements. Well done, completion. And well, I thought I had 20 minutes, but I'm halfway there. That's progression, right here. Now, this is where I think it gets really interesting because all those meta rewards from different games are gathered into an achievement system, which is part of an overarching profile. So for players, it doesn't matter anymore whether they play a racing game or a strategy game or a first-person shooter. Um, they get an overview of all their rewards, they get an overview of how they have performed so far and they can sort of form hypotheses based on the visualized information given by these systems. So they can use the information taken from all those different different you know, hours behind their computer playing to learn stuff about themselves as video games. So they can learn stuff about being competitive or social, they can learn stuff about uh, the total amount of uh, achievements earned, they can learn stuff about you know, how good they are compared to other people, of course. But they can also learn whether they are better in wintertime or summertime, whether they were better when they did or did not have a girlfriend or boyfriend. You know, as long as you have the visualized information, you can come up with your hypotheses and test them based on, on the generated data. Now, I hope that you can see where I'm going with this. Um, ah, I really wanted to show you this. I'm just going to describe it. This is what got messed up in the process with the technicals. So this is taken from Getminder, and Getminder is a wonderful uh, non-profit organization in Sweden by Hans Rusling, who is an international professor of uh, health, and he uses very boring data sets to create very interesting uh, visualizations. And as I said, I don't think I can press play here, so I'll just leave that. But what happens if I press play? This is the history of health and wealth in the world. What would happen if I could press play? is that the color-coded countries, because that is what they are, start becoming healthier and wealthier over time. That's simply what it is. Yeah, and this uses a scatter plot matrix, which is very useful for displaying a whole lot of data. You can enter maybe five or six variables in this life expectancy, vertically, uh, income per person horizontally, uh, and then of course color coding, size of the bubble, its population, and display over time. So I think that you agree that if you can play around with this, what you do is you really dig into otherwise really boring data sets. Okay, these are lists provided by World Health, World, World Health Organization and the UN, for example. So what it does, information visualization amplifies recognition and it makes you want to form hypotheses and falsify or verify them. Now, the other thing I need to explain is I just explain something about data doubles. And data doubles are the virtual versions of yourself. We just, with the keynote speakers, we saw something about the 
publicly visible data doubles created by them by using search engines and, and, and publishing, etc. Um, I just told you a bit about the gaming data doubles. So these are doubles comprised purely out of information. And we all have these. Right? We have a social data double because we use Twitter, we use Facebook. With gaming data doubles, if you play a lot of video games, so you connect to these networks. And uh, we have social data doubles. Okay, now what I would like to do in the classroom of the future is have an educational data double that uses the power of visualized information and is uh, engaging by means of digital rewards. We can reward the, you know, the heck out of them because they don't cost much these digital rewards. So how would this work in principle? Ooh, that's a lot of text. Um, you capture data first, that's the first step. Yeah, you capture data and for now, of course, computers uh, cannot measure how much we know. You, know. you can only measure sort of binary states. Even with video games, you can measure like levels completed, etc. You can measure total shots fired and those things. So we're not going to pretend, or I'm not going to pretend, that you could capture actual knowledge acquisition. But if you focus on the periphery of knowledge acquisition or the symptoms of knowledge acquisition, there's a whole lot you can capture. You can capture whether somebody is often late or on time, present or absent, of course. Um, whether somebody drinks a whole lot of coffee or not, and how much coffee, um, what kind of music they listen to, do they take uh, uh, you know, extra tutoring, are they involved in extracurricular uh, activities, etc. Et and who could enter this data? Well, the usual suspects, teachers, parents, and students themselves. Uh, and where would this be entered? Well, you know, it's a luxury, of course, talking about something that doesn't exist yet. Um, because we don't know what kind of devices there will be, but if you look at the rise of mobile devices in the past couple of years, it is uh, reasonable to expect that there will be more and more entry points for more and more complex data. So then, after you've captured the data, as I said, you reward those students to keep them engaging with your virtual platform. Right? You keep them engaging, you keep them keen on entering data, and you keep parents keen on entering data. Um, and then you would move on to the visualization, which would ultimately, hopefully, lead to um, students developing metacognitive learning strategies or reflection on their own learning. And finally, you would bind it, store it, and connect it. And of course, I took this from uh, Xbox Live, and this is not real. This, as I said, this doesn't exist. This is what it could look like. But the most important thing, I believe, of one of those doubles is not that it is, uh, you know, that it has like a little, little avatar or uh, that it is necessarily connected to other profiles. You don't have to turn education into a spectator sport. Um, but what the most important thing is, is that it's permanent, and that it's, that it's tracked, and that it's captured, and that you can, in the future, reflect on your learning. You know, two years ago, if you, could, you can take your educational data double with you from primary to secondary school, to university, or vocational education. Okay, so one uh, or two, you know, uh, responses are appropriate. First of all, I said it's brilliant. We can, we can start using this more. Please give it to me. Well, I don't have it. Uh, it's not here yet. I expect that the people from the electronic learning environments would pick up on this kind of thing, not my presentation, because this is not my unique idea. If you need a list of sources, I can provide. Um, but the trend of gamification is really everywhere, and I do believe that soon this will be picked up on by those, uh, those developers. And of course, the other you know, response is, this is a stupid idea, don't do this, please, because we don't want to you know, invade on our students' privacy, we don't want to make education more competitive than it already is, um, and of course, there's also something called the digital divide. We cannot assume all youngsters to be as adept at interpreting these interfaces, so that's, you know, can go two ways with this. 